I'm not aware if all of you are experts in masonry. And masonry is, in fact, one of the oldest building material. Uh, according to some surveys in different countries, about half of the existing built heritage is made of this material. This depends a lot on ge geographic location. So in some countries, there are very few masonry buildings. In some other older countries, particularly Europe, the amount of uh, uh, masonry buildings is quite high. Masonry is not a very simple definition because it basically consists of adding some uh, masonry units, some pieces of stone or brick on top of each other with or without some masonry to make them together. And so in a simplified way, this is typically a material which has a visible internal structure. So the masonry units are normally quite large and we can see them. And it has very low tensile strength. Of course, there are modern applications where you put reinforcement to overcome this deficiency of the material, but I will not be talking about reinforced masonry today. It's a very similar material to reinforced concrete in several applications. Now, why is this important? The fact that the masonry heterogeneity is visible at naked eye, it's because it affects the way the material performs. And so, uh, as you can see on your right, um, the behavior of masonry in tension and shear is totally controlled by the joint. And this means that um, uh, it's basically a discontinued part of the material that um, controls uh, the, the slipping of the units and the opening of the cracks. This is what we call normally the weakest link. Also, when you have compression, because you have, again, a composite material, there will be uh, stresses development, developing because of the different elastic properties. And the fracture will be very similar, in fact, to any uh, concrete-like material uh, with joint cracks that go, well, through, or continuous cracks that go through the head, through the joints and through the units. And this is, um, uh, well, obviously a composite mechanism of failure. And here you can see, you, you have a clear picture of the influence of uh, the arrangement of the units uh, within the masonry. And so you have basically, these are masonry shear walls, so they are subjected to lateral in-plane loading. And the stone is always the same, but it's arranged in different ways. So to the left, with a very regular structure, you could see a monument type wall of very good quality. In this case, dry stacked. Then you have a regular good quality masonry wall and a very regular. And you can see that the behavior in this case in cyclic loading is very different in terms of energy dissipation. And not only the behavior in terms of energy dissipation, loading and loading is very different, but also the peak load is quite different. So if you assume the friction angle of, of uh, the masonry wall and not the joint itself, you can see that for a regular wall, you get a tangent of friction of 0 0.4, which is basically what almost all codes in the world adopt. But for the other walls, you get a much lower friction angle. And in fact, normally we use other, uh, let's say failure surfaces besides more Coulomb to replicate the failure of these walls because more Coulomb is not very adequate. But the key issue here is that even though the materials are the same, the arrangement of the units leads to totally different responses. You know? So basically when we talk about measuring, in my view, we should talk about two focus areas. One is conservation and rehabilitation. You can think about cultural heritage buildings and cultural heritage buildings are very important for the societies because of the identity they provide to the societies. They are very important because tourism is, is certainly a leading source of income in the world in the current millennia. And it's also important because uh, in many of our countries, a lot of, of what we have has already built. And if you look uh, at Europe as construction market, about 50% of the market is in maintenance of rehabilitation. And again, most of these buildings will be made of masonry. 
Now, basically there are two issues when we talk about the, the built cultural heritage. We have the cultural heritage, which because of tourism, because of identity, because of their significance to the societies, we are supposed as engineers, as professionals, to make them last forever. And we have the other resisting built heritage, which is a sustainability issue. And so we th throw buildings away from the point of view of use of resources and economy is not the best approach. And so basically, in many cases, we have to maintain and extend the life of what we have. And for this, there is a proper methodology, which independently of being cultural heritage or not, we always contemplate understanding the past of the building, some survey, some inspection, and some modeling. And the modeling will be fundamental in this process of reaching a decision on the safety of the building. And this is what we'll be talking about, how to model these buildings. A second issue, or a second focus area, is again the needs of the world population. And so very briefly, uh, in a very simplified way, some estimates where you see here from the US National Academy of Sciences, they expect that in the next 50 years, we will build as much as we built in the last 10,000. And so this is a huge demand for the planet, which is difficult if we are not being efficient in the uses of our resources. The other issue is that uh, not only the population will grow, but the population is moving to the cities, and this is an unstoppable movement. And so not necessarily the buildings are where we need them. And so there will be a bright future in the world for housing. And this can be small houses like it's traditional in Europe, where in many cases, these buildings are made of, of, of masonry, or they can be, well, high rise buildings where masonry is, well, hardly competitive and is not used in most countries in the world as a structural material, but is still used as infills. And so masonry will still be present in most of our built heritage of the future. Now, we talk about modeling and computations. Traditionally, we talk about a sort of two different approaches. These words have been stabilized and been used for several decades. Not necessarily the best, but these are the ones that people tend to use. And normally we talk about micro-modeling, and so some sort of modeling where the units are, are modeled separately. And so you have units and joints modeled in a separate way. And this, of course, can be used in large-scale buildings, but it's not normally the case because it's rather time-consuming and complex. This is an example of a, a UNESCO heritage site in the south of Portugal, a Roman temple subjected to an earthquake. Or you can have a, an approach where we assume the material is homogeneous, either isotropic or anisotropic. And these are examples of modeling of structural components, so a shear wall, a wall subjected to wind, or full buildings subjected to, in this case, an earthquake again, where you have a traditional, in this case, earthen building or earthen church, which is subjected to an earthquake. And the roof is again, as traditional, uh, of very limited quality and not well connected to the building. And so you have a very localized type of failure indicated by this red line, which provides a sort of hinging rocking mechanism out of plane. Um, another exciting way of addressing masonry is to try to be in between the micro and the macro approach. And instead of going to the lab and making expensive and very difficult uh, testing, we try to replace this by, um, let's say, our simulations and to replace this by mathematics and physics. And so we basically introduce the properties and the geometry of the masonry components and we obtain information by a process, a mathematical process of homogenization, and we turn this into a homogeneous continuum. A very important difference between this approach and the past approach is that here, the material model is introduced in the software as a composite material model for a composite material. And here, no, we introduce the geometry and the behavior of the different components. 
and the outcome of the mathematical process is a homogenized continuum which let's say a uh, failure surface we do not know and it's not built in in my computer and then there is another different approach which we normally denote as structural component models which can be used for very specific applications in the case of seismic engineering this is quite traditional that we try to simulate the model in a simple way um, which is appropriate for the specific loading conditions allowing more complex input and more complex analysis still using very very few degrees of freedom and fast computation so these are very good for engineering applications now i'm going to show you some of the recent developments that we have been made making in the last years multi-physics is something that we are working extensively uh, mostly for two applications which is lime carbonation and refractory materials lime uh, as you probably know is a material much used in historic masonry it's still used in uh, in today's construction for example for mixed cement lime cement mortars um, and most of the old buildings were made with lime as a binder and lime requires co2 to, to set or to harden and this is a very slow process and it's far less understood process from the chemistry of cement like materials and so we have been studying the possibilities of understanding better how these materials performed and this is a model that was developed uh, a couple of decades ago by two researchers one italian and one us and we have implemented this model which has very complicated coupled models with the interaction between all the different fields in this case the thermal the humidity, the humidity the carbon dioxide and the reaction field they are all coupled together what we have been doing is to obtain data to fill these models and so how does the humidity field progress in a mortar made with lime how does the carbonation progress how do the mechanical properties evolve and this is not very simple to test but we have de developed techniques to test this so we are able to see for example how these fields evolve in time and in depth and these are real experiments and these are uh, our simulation as you can see they are relatively good and for example this is a final simulation of a mortar specimen subjected to compression and here you can see that there is an average compression so this is the, the central line of the specimen this is the central line of the specimen and this is the edge and obviously in a cylinder the carbonation starts from the outside because the co2 goes inside and goes very slowly because at the time mortar sets and the, the the mortar dries at the same time you close the pore by carbonation and so as you can see even though you have an average stress the stress is not uniform and the stress for example is much is much higher in the edge than in the center because of the carbonation and this varies with time and so what we're working together now is how to see how this evolves with time in order to make adequate to have an adequate understanding of the durability the performance and the mechanical behavior of masonry made with these materials and there is a very exciting new uh, innovative training network that uh, just started led by university of Mino, with 15 phd students in six european countries addressing how to use lime adequately uh, in the construction for now and for the future a second other example of complicated multi-physics approaches is for refractory masonry this is something that we start working um, a few years ago and basically the idea is how to use dry stack blocks or masonry in fact adequately and what we want to do is basically to use all the best tools that we have available from the mechanical point of view to the experimental and numerical point of view to be sure in this case to have steel ladles so the level where you produce the steel which is durable because it has extremely high costs for the industry when you try to replace this masonry uh, which is a refractory material and which is in fact replaced often in the production process this is also used for glass production and for any any ovens or kilns and so these are some of the applications we're doing with multi-physics 
Now, I would like to show you two other applications today. One application has to do with seismic engineering, where you have dynamic effects. And of course, we can ask why earthquakes? Well, earthquakes are a recurrent problem. They appear everywhere through the world, and they are the deadliest uh, natural hazards. So this is the natural hazard which kills more people across the world. And I show you here two examples of how earthquakes work. This is a facade with two retaining walls subjected to an, hour, an earthquake perpendicular to your screen. And if you have a, so, uh, a strong shake in a very weak material like this one, you kill the people inside, you kill the people outside, and you lose all the property and all whatever you have inside. Now, it's very simple to apply a few measures to make these buildings better. This is um, a shaking table of a strengthened building. As you can see, it has been strengthened with some connectors to the inner timber floor with an external steel plate here, which is connecting the joists inside. On the sides, because you have a neighbor, you don't want to use the wall of the neighbor. And so it was connected by a steel angle. So basically what we did, we increased the connection between the floors, which are not very stiff because they are still timber and we did not make them harder. And we connected properly with the walls. And by doing this, as you can see, well, there is the collapse of one pier in the top. This is not acceptable for our code. You can see a lot of movement in plane in the top but you can also see a lot of movement out of plane. So we have a combination of in plane and out of plane movement. And these structures tend to collapse out of plane. Connecting, as you saw in the previous structure that collapsed out of plane, by connecting with the inside and connecting the corners, we are able to increase the capacity. In this case, we increase the capacity more than 50% by a very inexpensive and simple intervention. Now, I would like to show you uh, a blind test uh, shaking table that we made. We made basically two tests, one with a, with a brick masonry uh, sort of mock-up or a specimen, and another with, with a stone specimen. I'll show you the brick specimen. And as you can see, this is a facade with two retaining walls. And as you can also see from the test, this failure is extremely brittle so it's very very sudden it collapses in a fraction of a second this is the same test in slow motion and you you are able to see that as the earthquake develops there is a sort of a, a v-shaped block forming here it's almost collapsing but it did not collapse and then it's a sort of l-shaped or almost rectangular then in the end well, you're losing this part, but not all of it, just this tiny bit. And also the retaining wall collapse in the back. This is almost collapsing and this is almost collapsing the rest of the pier. This will collapse next. The pier will not collapse, but it's almost collapsing a little bit of more seismic energy and it would add collapse. So as you can see, these are extremely fast movements, which challenge our computational skills. And this is something that we still have to do better. Uh, this was used as a blind test for professionals, for uh, engineers and researchers to make simulations before they knew the results by using different tools. And the results are not very exciting. And so these are different blind predictions from different experts. As you can see, the scatter is too large. On average, the experimental result and the predicted result is close. The good news is that uh, uh, most of the predictions, 70% uh, or 80% are conservative. And so, you, as you can see, um, the, the participants of the blind test, they were mostly conservative, which is good from the engineering point of view. We are not predicting well, but we're predicting um, on the safe side. And this is for the other buildings. So one is for the, the, the masonry, the, uh, the clay brick masonry and the stone. And here yeah, all of them were uh, on the safe side, but the average is very far away from the experimental predicted results. And so seismic engineering 
when you have this very brittle failure, which is typical of existing buildings, is not typical of modern management buildings, unreinforced, it's at the moment something extremely difficult to predict, if not almost outside our uh, capabilities. And it requires for sure a stochastic approach and a very complex definition of the, seism the seismic signal. I'm going to show you two developments that we have been doing, trying to focus on this. So trying to focus on simple models that we can use extensively, we can use thousands of times, and try to bring stochastics and try to bring reliability to our analysis. This has been done together with Politecnico di Milano and the University of Catania, both in Italy. And so the idea is to have better tools, okay? Tools which are very fast. And this is a PhD of one of my, well, it's a result of PhD of one of my students, where we try to develop a code which is based on a very few unlimited degrees of freedom. So basically we replace the continuum by special elements, which include springs, uh, these springs uh, have the typical configuration in tension, compression, and shear, which is basically plastic behavior in shear and energy dissipation in the other context. And here we're comparing a, uh, a standard finite element model, as you can see, with 50,000 degrees of freedom, with a super small model with 600 degrees of freedom. And as you can see, on the left, you have the, well, the continuum model, which is a rotating crack model, traditional. Uh, in this case, using Diana, and this is uh, the, the simplified model. Uh, as you can see, the results are comparable, and you can see that our gain of speed is 30 times faster because our model has very, a very limited number of degrees of freedom. And by doing this, then I can move to fragility curves, and I can basically input, in this case, as you can see, 2,000 dynamic analyses or 300 by using different approaches of the, uh, in, in order to re replicate the seismic um, action. And I can obtain curves like this that will tell me how many buildings will be affected, how many buildings will be destroyed by a given uh, seismic scenario. Another application is another PhD thesis that was developed by uh, another PhD student um, trying to use a commercial code. And basically the idea was to use an homogenization which is carried out outside the commercial code. And these are examples of the homogenization. And so we are able to replicate um, and to introduce in the, in the computer code um, the actual behavior of masonry. And then we basically input this in sort of links. And these links are, um, um, well, they have nonlinear properties. And again, they have very few degrees of freedom. And so again, we are able by doing this to replicate the results that we obtain. And here you can see that still using two commercial softwares, uh, we are able to have a gain of speed of one to 10, which is again, very important if you're going to run a few hundred or a few thousand analysis. These are more applied uh, obviously to modern buildings where homogenization and masonry is a periodic structure. We have been doing developments to use non-periodic homogenization. And this is one application to the castle here in my city, where basically we combine laser scanning, automatic edge detection, that I'm able to capture the different stones automatically. And then I have a stochastic or a statistical representation of this dimensions, and I can put this in my models. And this is a comparison of a heterogeneous model versus homogeneous model. And I'm using a homogeneous model, which is based on a statistic representation of the heterogeneous model. And you can see that the results are very close. This is the case before strengthening with very weak mortar. And this is the case after strengthening with a very strong mortar, where the results are even better, obviously, because if the bond is better, the material is more homogeneous. Now, I've been showing you some uh, developments. Um, in uh, seismic assessment of existing structures. And I would like to show some applications to real structures. Developments I showed you are more at the level of research. And of course, uh, not everything we do can directly enter um, um, engineering application. 
And for engineering application, in most cases, we, we, uh, we need to use simplified models because we have difficulties to get data from the structure. We have difficult to know the damage. We have difficulties, obviously, to characterize the geometry and the different building materials. So we have been trying to do applications to very complex buildings. This is the, uh, the Shah Mosque in Isfahan, where, as you can see here, is a very complex structure because it, it has two vaults or two domes, an inner dome, which is, uh, let's say, low rise and the, and the external dome which is very high rise and then they are connected by a series of stiffness in this case and the series of, of timber elements so we did several um, we uh, we went to the site we measured the vibration modes we tuned our model according to the measured vibration modes and then we did a couple of applications to understand the safety of the of the structure both for earthquakes and for the metro line that was originally passing very close to this um, UNESCO World Heritage Square. In this case, the structure was safe for both of the loadings. So another church that we considered, this is in New Zealand, um, that suffered the effects of the series of earthquakes of Christchurch. So as you can see, um, it was heavily damaged after the, 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 well, the, the different earthquakes. And after a long discussion, it was finally demolished recently. But um, the, the simulation what we did was to understand if the strengthening that was implemented before the earthquake was successful or not. And so our simulation allowed to obtain that the strengthening that was implemented was not adequate, the structure failed, and it was supposed to fail according to our models meaning that we need, in some cases, better engineering to solve these complex problems. This is another temple we worked uh, in, in Bagan. And so um, Bagan has this amazing, well, Myanmar is this amazing valley with over, I think, about 4,000 temples, which have been built in different periods. And this is one of the temples that was damaged extensively in the earthquake of 2016. And again, uh, what we did as simulation was to justify damage and study different strengthening scenarios to see how this building could have better survived and could survive the next earthquake. The final application of, um, of a structure in Peru, which again was very heavily damaged by an earthquake, uh, it was built in the 18th century, is one of the most complex structures we ever analyzed with a mix of adobe, so earth masonry or earth structures combined with clay brick uh, and timber all together. And the, um, the structure was affected again by a series of earthquakes. Well, it lost most of the main nave and the dome. Also, the front facade was severely damaged. And so there was a, an interesting discussion on demolishing or strengthening, okay? And the decision was to strengthen it. And hopefully the works are, are expected to start next year. And these are some of the details of the model, which is really hyper complex with all the different materials and very sophisticated connections. But according to our modeling strategy, well, it was evident that the structure should have been damaged as it was. So most of the cracks from the earthquake we were able to replicate from the front facade to this crack, which is, exists there and this crack. And then with the strengthening that is being applied, we'll be able to have adequate safety of the structure for a cold earthquake. Now, to I think to finish or almost to finish, I would like to show a different application, uh, which is blast engineering, a very high strain rate. Again, why blast and impact? Well, there's many reasons, from terrorism to gas explosions to impact because of different sources. Okay, and masonry is also affected by this. A key issue is industry because many industries all of the sudden are prone to suffer an explosion. Okay, and this changes everything we know about static and seismic loading because the strain rates are so high that, that the uh, the material properties change and the tools that we have to use for analysis are also different. And so there's very limited information for masonry. And here are some examples of what we try to do by using what is called a dropway tower 
to characterize the behavior of maize at very high strain rates. So these are pieces of brick subjected to very high strain rates and these markers we follow by a, a, a very fast camera and we are able to track the stresses and the strains with the load cell on the camera. So this is a modern specimen and this is a maize specimen. So basically we find things like this which is up to strain rates of about 100, 200. There is no increase of strength. After this point the strength increases and increases more or less linearly. And so if you're talking about quasi-static loading, seismic uh, engineering, the properties are constant. As long as you go to very fast strain rates, the property changes. And all the property change in a different way. The strength, Young's model, the structure energy, etc., maximum strain, etc. So we did also a series of tests. Um, again, these are uh, using different equipment, from pressure sensors to lasers. And here we have different infills, for example, simulating the explosion of, of gas inside of a building. And well, basically you put the explosion and there will be cracks and there will be some movement. And of course, if the explosion is too fast, there will be nothing as it is now. And again, we did the same. So we have been developed models, which some of them are the models from Diana that we extended for high strain rates. And again, these are some examples that I showed before of using an homogenized model versus a 2.5 or shell model, those versus a full 3D. And so you have a, a, a gain by using, again, homogenized techniques of almost 200 in speed. And this is another example for a measuring fill. And you can see here the importance of this factor that affects the motor properties. And so basically, by changing the DIF influence, you can get any response. And so here you can see very different responses from the same wall to the same blast just by changing the properties that we were able to obtain uh, experimentally. And so in the end, we are able to do things like this, which should be in the codes and are in some codes for, for blast engineering, which tell you basically for a given exposure, what would be the minimum thickness of the wall which is needed in order to protect the occupants and to protect the property. These are some applications to different buildings. This is a, a building in Iraq that was attacked by um, terrorism in 2006, 2007. The first time they put a, a bomb on top because they were doing conservation works. And so all the metal you see here is a scaffolding. And the second time it was again attacked with, with, a, with a bag. And these are two scenarios that we did for the scenario it suffered in 2006 and two scenarios basically of a car sized explosive de device at different distances. And so we are able to, to show that uh, if you do, uh, uh, well, if you have the scenario 2006, the damage is as we expected enormous and the minarets are gone and most of the dome is gone. And then if you still have a portable uh, improvised explosive device, for scenario B is not a problem, for car size is a problem, and so you need to have sufficient distance. And this is a similar study for our, um, for one of the most important uh, railway stations in Lisbon. So again, two scenarios were considered, uh, a small pack of TNT close to the building and the car pack TNT explosion close to the building at different distances. And so if you have luggage, we see there's small damage. If there is a van, if it's very close, the building will be destroyed if it's at 25 meters and you create some some safety distance and, and some protection then the damage uh, there is some damage but the building will remain usable and these are direct applications and definitions of the required safety measures my conclusions i tried to go very briefly on uh, some overview of some computational applications of measuring some of the things we have been doing recently in my understanding, even though measuring has been around for 10,000 years, it will remain around, be it in terms of the existing built heritage and new housing. And so masonry, because it's composite, we normally consider three approaches, which are more or less stabilized. Micromodeling, macromodeling, homogenization. There is a fourth approach that is very specific of the application, which I normally address as structural component models 
which is very popular in seismic engineering. The new buzzwords of today of computational mechanics are for sure multi-physics and multi-scale. And both of them are applicable to masonry. I try to show you applications of both for engineering problems. Um, note that the two innovative training networks we are working with, they involve major industry in Europe. Uh, still, I, uh, my understanding is clear that research and engineering go in parallel. We are able to have amazing computational labs in our computers today that can simulate anything. But when you go to engineering and particularly monumental application, you have to simplify because we don't have enough data and the problem is over complex. So we have to be able to use both advanced and very advanced and innovative computational models to solve, understand, address complex engineering problems and then to solve more standard real cases where we need simpler tools. Also, extreme events remain a major challenge because structures have never been designed and conceived for extreme events. Existing structures before the codes, they have been mostly designed for gravitational loading. And so I showed you two examples of very harmful hazards or um, sources of, of, of losses. One is earthquake engineering, the other is blast engineering. Earthquake engineering is super popular. Blast engineering, very few people do. Um, and it's something that we also have to know more about. And I stop here and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you very much.